Okay, we're going. Okay, so I'd like to welcome you all to our third webinar in the IGNIS series. And this is a new series that um, we've recently started or kind of resurrected from an old series. So um, we're really happy to have you all join us here today. We've been getting a lot of great feedback on um, what we're doing. So at the end of the webinar, if you'd like to, we'll ask you to fill out a quick survey for us. And for any of you who haven't joined us for an IGNIS webinar before, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's exactly what we're hoping to do today. We'd like to ignite your curiosity about e-learning, and that's our topic for today. And I just noticed that I didn't give myself a timer, so I'm going to go ahead and time myself here. Okay, yeah, random. Oh, Amber, can you fix it? I just set myself to nine hours. Okay, so this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL, and my name is Alyssa Sells, and I'm the SBCTC eLearning Program Administrator. My counterpart is Jennifer Wessam, and she is the SBCTC Program Administrator for Faculty Development. And she's actually attending a retreat today, and um, as far as I know, she's planning to log in, but I haven't seen her yet. And also joining us this afternoon is our Collaborate Rep, Amber Goulart, and she's graciously agreed to help me moderate this afternoon. And this is her third webinar with us, so she's attended all three, and she's been just a gem for helping us out. And um, we have a really super great lineup of presenters for you today, and I'll introduce them here in just a minute. And if you haven't tested your audio, feel free to go ahead and do that while I'm speaking. And the directions have been up here on uh, your screen here for a minute. So if you want to use your mic later, you'll need to test, test your audio. You'll be able to access the session recording on Jennifer's ATL blog, and I am pasting that into the chat window right now. And so there's the link. We'll post the recording for this webinar as soon as we get it um, after the session, and you'll find be able to find our other webinar links there as well. And uh, looks like Jen's having some trouble. I see that she says her internet is frozen. Sorry, Jen. Okay, uh, let's see. We're going to start today by running through um, just a few of the tools. And um, this is our session title here, Ignite eLearning. So let's go ahead and dive into looking at our tools here. So this is your meeting interface for anyone who's not familiar with Collaborate. There's a whiteboard. That's where you're seeing my slides right now. There are some whiteboard tools right underneath that that we're going to be using in a minute. You can see me in the upper audio video panel. There's a picture of me there. There's a participants window that you can scroll through to see who all is in attendance. And then there's a chat box near the bottom. So we are going to actually use some of the participant tools today. So if you just want to take a peek at what some of these are, there are some emoticons there. You can step away if you need to um, go answer the phone or whatever you need to do, but feel free to do that. If you need to speak, feel free to raise your hand and we can call on you. We're going to use the polling tool in just a minute. This image is slightly different than what you see in your panel right now because I've changed it to ABC for our poll. You do have some permissions for audio and chat and different things. And you'll know that your talk is on when you see a blue microphone. So when you're speaking, you need to turn that on. And when you're finished, please click the talk button again to turn that off. And you'll see the talk button in the audio video panel um, above the participant panel. All right, moving on. Here is the chat window. And um, what we're going to do is have you type questions into the chat as we go. Just go ahead and type them there and click on Enter, and it will put your questions and comments right into the running chat that's at the bottom of the screen on your left. And this is the whiteboard toolbar I was talking about just a minute ago. You'll see on the left an enlarged version of it so that you can see it just a little bit better. We're going to practice on this slide. I would like you to go to your toolbar and find the icon that looks like a sun. That's the pointer tool. And if you hover over that, 
you can hold it. It will put out some different icons that you can choose from. I'm going to choose a smiley face. And um, I'm going to just plop it right here on this slide. So if anybody wants to practice, feel free to go ahead and do that. We're actually going to use this tool on the next slide. All right, I see some check marks and some finger pointing. That's great. All right, I think we've got the hang of it. So on this next slide, we're curious where in Washington you are. So if you'll just take your pointer tool that you selected and figure out where you're at. I'm in Everett today, so I'm going to plop my little smiley face right there. This is just a fun thing to kind of see where we're all gathering from, because we get folks from all over Washington. Got some down on um, the border down there by Oregon and Idaho. Zach, is that you? Yep, that is that Zach's is joining us yep, from, from Mount Hood today. So. Mount Hood Community College. All right, gosh, we've got a really good centralized group there down the middle. Looks like we're all on the I. Most of us are on the I-5 corridor today, but we do have a couple of outliers there. All right, so our um, we're going to take a little poll here, it's a demographic poll of our audience. We're just curious what who our audience is composed of. So if you'll go over to your poll, looks like some of you have already found the polling tool and um, go ahead and click on your response. I am an administrator, so I'm going to answer C. So if everybody will take just one second and do that. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go up to our tools and I'm going to publish our poll so that you guys can all see how you responded. So um, we've got some that didn't participate, but we've got a good group of um, people here, lots of administrators, lots of full-time, lots of uh, part-time. So great group to have. It's more of a curiosity just to kind of see um, who we're getting um, in, our, in our audience. All right, um, some quick meeting etiquette. We're going to raise our hands when we want to speak. There's lots, a lot of us. And um, we have our microphones set to four simultaneous speakers, which covers one of us moderators and um, all of the presenters. I saw somebody's hand go up. Were you just practicing or do you have a question? Maybe we're just practicing. Okay. Um, you can also use your emoticon to um, indicate approval or clap for a job well done. And these are all in the participants panel. There's lots of um, little tools in there. I'll give you all a smiley face there. Okay. Again, click on that talk button when you want to speak or when you're called on to speak. And then when you're finished, please go ahead and turn that off. And um, we're not going to interrupt our presenters as they're speaking because we're on an Ignite style format where they're just going to tell us um, quickly what their topics are and we want them to run through that and not be interrupted. And what we would ask you to do is to go ahead and type your relevant questions, whatever questions and comments you have while that person is presenting into the chat box. And then when we're at the end of our presentations, we will revisit all of those questions and comments and give our presenters a chance to respond. All righty. OK, Jennifer, yes, I see you. She was having, she's logged in, but I don't know if she's, she's got her hand up. Jen? OK, well, I'm going to keep going because I'm not sure if her computer is working. Oh, she says never mind. All right, so um, for any of you that may be new to on learning and are maybe just here just because you're curious, um, I thought it would be good to start with some working definitions just in case you weren't sure what we were, some of the language we might be using today. So face-to-face, -face, I'm sure you've all heard that term. That's instruction or lecture or interaction that occurs in person in a traditional classroom setting. There's kind of a new um, a new type of classroom, a new style of classroom uh, that I've seen become really popular in just in the last couple of years, and that's the web enhanced classroom. This is for all intents and purposes a regular face to face classroom, except that it's enhanced with some type of technology. The teacher choosing to integrate or use some technology in their instruction, but it's not being um, put into the class schedule as a hybrid or a blended course. And a hybrid or blended course is a course that will displace up to approximately 50% of the instruction or lecture 
or interaction um, by online instruction. And sometimes this is in a flipped model. And if you missed our webinar on flipping, I'll give that out to you at the end of the webinar. You can go back and check out what that is. And then the last category here is online. And this is instruction uh, that occurs 100% online in a virtual classroom, teachers and students never see each other. So that was just to kind of get us all on the same page. And then here we are to our fabulous presenters. And we are joined today by Liz Falconer. She's the e-learning director at Renton Technical College. We're also joined by Zach Hudson, who um, is an expert in reading and writing at Mount Hood Community College. And we're joined by Rosemary Regal. She's English faculty at Centralia College. And um, it's a great group. We had a little practice session yesterday. And I'm actually looking really forward to hearing and seeing all of their slides, because we just got smidgens of them yesterday. So Liz, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Liz is going to talk to us about collaboration. And when you're finished, I will um, go ahead and make the transition over to Zach for you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me OK? I guess, let's see. I need to go to my slide. Here we are. Um, Sorry about that, okay. Liz. I forgot to switch over so, for you. Um, I'm, I'm talking about collaborations, easily creating community learning. Um, and um, I was going to start just a little bit with my background for you. Um, I have degrees in pedagogy and education. I have a long time ongoing interest in, in teaching. I was an ESL teacher for many years. And I took a break to do a few things like raise kids. And when I came back, there was the internet. Um, and I was really fascinated with the possibilities that this provided. Um, at RTC, I moved into the position of curriculum and technology specialist a few years ago as a faculty support position. And then the shift to e-learning, becoming a part of all learning, which we talked about just a minute ago, led to the new position of e-learning director, which I started last summer. So now I'm not just in faculty support. I am directing. So um, um, obviously, my power has increased immensely <laughs> um, because of the world, in the world of e-learning. Um, depending on the day, I'm, I'm directing movies, or I'm a traffic cop. And sometimes I attempt to keep the whole orchestra together. Uh, I recently developed and taught two Canvas network MOOCs on hybrid teaching and learning. Uh, it's called Hybrid Courses, Best of Both Worlds. So I've gotten really interested in, in hybrid teaching uh, the last couple of years. And I'm currently coordinating and teaching in our new e-learning certificate program here at RTC. Our first cohort has about 15 SBCTC college participants in it. Um, and a few of those people are here today. I saw names coming up. So we're having a blast learning together. And of course, um, this is a course uh, that is full of faculty. And faculty tend to be um, a little bit independent. And they're working from the standpoint of people who need to make their own decisions because they, their classes are their domains. And they need to space to do things their own way and in their own time um, as teachers. So as learners, I found that they can be sometimes difficult to coordinate uh, as a unit if you want them to stick together as a class. And you want people to feel like they're part of a community. This is the kind of person you're working with here in the faculty um, courses. So it's a little much, a little bit, little much. It's a little bit like herding cats uh, when working with, compared to, for example, working with a more regular student who tends to feel a bit more obliged to follow your lead. This is just speaking from my personal experience here. <laughs> So um, in our online course, which is an online course about teaching online, when setting up our icebreaker discussion, I wanted to give the participants both the freedom to be themselves and also to stimulate interaction and to start creating a feeling of a community. And when I thought about our initial discussion, I dreaded the idea of a forum that just says, you know, what do you want to get out of this course? And having the predictable, I want to learn a lot about online teaching and things like that. So I also wanted to start making use of the free internet tools that we have at our fingertips in the Canvas environment. So um, I had the faculty start off our course with introducing themselves with a thing link. 
And Singlink is a great site, um, and you can use it in Canvas quite easily. Make sure to use the iFrade embed code, embed code when you put it in Canvas. Um, and our first discussion was uh, called Your Subject and Overview. So the participants were to post links to sites that showed what they do. And these links here, they're not live, but in, they're, they're live in, in real life. <laughs> Um, and so they could put videos or songs or subject matter links on there. And it turned out to be a really fun activity. Some people posted photos of themselves, which allows you to see the more complete person, like Mitzi here, who teaches office skills at our school. And um, these are all links to sites that she uses. Uh, we also have a participant in early childhood education. As you can see here, this is one of the links on the left. And we have a TRIO grant coordinator uh, with the Seattle picture here. And it was really interesting to see the way people chose also to arrange their links. The TRIO grant coordinator, for example, um, explained, this is quotes, I included some representations of the work we do with students along the picture's bottom, organizational info along the mountain range, and some reasons we do the work in the sky. So it was interesting to see different ways people approached using the thing links. Here's another one that was quite you know, beautifully done. Uh, one of our participants teaches digital literacies online. And then the one on the right is another student who teaches creative writing. Um, the vibrancy of these images brought to the first discussion was wonderful. And I often feel that we don't take enough, enough advantage of the visual aspect of the internet in our online courses. And also that working with imagery helps stimulate people's hearts as, as well as their minds. Um, here's the last two images here I wanted to share um, uh, that represent the participant's subject matter and interests. And the interactive part of the assignment, was the part two of the assignment, was that everyone was asked to also add one or two links to other people's images. And it was really great to see the cross-pollination of ideas. So these links were also added to by, each, by the other participants. I think this could be used in any subject. Students always have a surprising amount of information to share if given the opportunity and inspiration. And another great thing about using something like this is that it lives beyond the course environment. It can be shared and used elsewhere. So I think there are lots of possibilities for, for this site. Thinglink.com is the site. Thinglink.com. So the sec second thing I wanted to share was crowdsourcing ideas. Um, I made a Google document for this, and then made a tab in the course that linked to the document so that students could navigate there easily. So you can see it circled in red here um, on, on the course tab. And we had two specific projects that we did, but having the tab there, you can go, go in there very easily to, to do that. Um, and for grading, note that whenever you have something that goes to an outside source like ThingLink or, um, or uh, the tab, well, the ThingLink was in our discussion, so that was fine. But this collaborate thing, um, you have to go into the doc and then uh, check for names, you know, just do a search for the names to make sure people have done it. Uh, it's not difficult to do, but you have to remember to go outside the course in order to do it. So regarding crowdsourcing, uh, I think that we teachers tend to feel like we have to be responsible for everything that happens, and we want to make sure that things go the way we want them to. Uh, but there have been a lot of shifts with online and hybrid teaching. And the mindset of learners helping themselves to learn, not having to feel the weight of all that teaching coming from you, is both freeing um, and somewhat confusing. So on how do, we release ourselves, how do we release ourselves from the control you know, in the classroom that we're used to, and how do we empower our learners to comfortably move into confident self-guidance and also to help each other learn is a big question. I think there's a real knack at getting used to creating assignments that emphasize this. So I want to share one of my assignments with you in this course. After the students had created some learning outcomes for their own courses, I was trying to figure out uh, a good follow-up assignment that would be useful and doable in one week. And my first idea was to have them create um, assignments themselves that would, would relate to that. But that would be way too time consuming, and they'd be working in silos. Um, so I had them uh, write down their outcomes that they wanted to achieve on the left-hand side of a document, this crowdsourced document. And that was the easy part. So they had different kind of outcomes they wanted to have achieved. And so, for example, in the carpentry course, he wanted to have uh, 
students identify and use typical uh, personal protective equipment for a residential construction that needs requirements. And then even though no one else is carpenters in the course, he had these really great um, assignment things come up. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just quick down, quick do the last one on here, which I thought was awesome. Have the students suit up with their safety gear, take a picture of themselves, and then insert the picture into ThingLink, and have them create a diagram that explains what and when they would use that certain piece of gear. So everyone had really great ideas. Just looking at someone else's assi assignments with fresh eyes, and there are lots and lots of thank yous going on back and forth. Uh, another collaboration I used in this document was a, the, 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 uh, the, the students shared tips on how do you avoid burnout. And I think that a lot of our students in community colleges have a lot of um, great ideas because they have a lot of uh, life experience. So that was the other thing we used it for. And I will put up the um, link to this collaboration site when I'm done. Everyone can go scroll through if you'd like. We also shared a word wall as another icebreaker in a recent, um, in a recent course. Um, and WordWall is Padlet.com is the one I use. There's other ones out there. It's very, very easy to use. You just um, throw it up there and let people um, add to it. And it's beautiful. Um, and this one we had students um, write down their, their teaching philosophy or their favorite quote about teaching and also translate it into another language. So we had the, the, the WordWall became um, multilingual. We have a lot of multilingual um, people in our courses. So we did that to practice using a Google Translate and just sharing our ideas this way. So very quickly, you can imagine these things coming up one by one. Collaborations engage students. They're meaningful. They build on experience. They stimulate active learning. And they build community. So um, I thought I made a word wall. If you'd like to go and uh, put your takeaways in this word wall, padlet.com backslash wall, March, Ig March Ignis. <laughs> um, and Please go there and share anything you think about this. I think you could open another window and go ahead and do that anytime. Um, and thanks so much for listening to this. And I also want to thank my students for allowing me to share the material here today. I've got 30, 34 seconds left. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, and we'll get back to some questions for Liz and the rest of our panel at the end here. Um, I saw a hand go up. Did somebody have a question now as we're transitioning between speakers? Fine, if you do, please feel free to go ahead and ask it. Uh, Zach, I'm getting you queued up. Okay. All right, here you go. Turning it over to Zach now, who's going to tell us what he's talking about. I won't spoil it for you, Zach. You can go ahead and tell everyone. All right, thanks. Now, I'd like you to think about the many ways that education has changed over the centuries. Uh, teachers have changed the students they teach, how they teach, and why. But one thing that stayed remarkably consistent is that teaching has taken place in a classroom or some designated space during a uh, specified time. Homework is assigned for the time outside of class, and students might meet teachers during office hours or by appointment. But the class itself exists between four walls, usually on some regular schedule. And that is true to this day. Now, this was no longer necessary when the advent of the personal computer and the internet made distance learning possible. You might think that this technology would change everything, and we would no longer think of classes existing only during a specified place and time. But our face-to-face -face classrooms have remained remarkably unchanged by these new ways to communicate. All that computer stuff is seen as separate from real classrooms. But what if I told you that you can use the kinds of structures that distance learning relies upon in your face-to-face -face classroom? And that furthermore, it would save you time and help your students. I'll focus on three things. Posting information and resources publicly online, keeping students informed about their grades online, and accepting and grading assignments electronically. The biggest change I've made to my teaching in recent years is in trying to give more students more information about my class. I found that some students, especially at-risk students, need a little nudge to stay involved and caught up. I get every student's email address at the beginning of the term, and I save it in the list. I can then send out very quick and easy announcements and reminders. I can remind the whole class about homework or an upcoming quiz, or I can clarify something to everyone if I realize that some students are confused. If a student misses two classes in a row, I email him and ask if everything's OK. If I'm teaching a condensed class, oh, I am teaching a condensed class this winter that started halfway through the term, and it was very important that students showed up on the first day with their textbooks. So I checked my class list. Uh, which I was able to get from the 
uh, from my school, got student email addresses, and emailed everyone introducing myself uh, and asking them to get the book. And then once more, I emailed them saying I was looking forward to seeing them the next day, and I included the time and the room number. It might only have helped one or two students, but those are exactly the students who are likely in danger of dropping out, uh, who are new at this whole college thing, and who just aren't very organized yet. My class might, just might, make a difference as to whether they come back next quarter, and I want to do everything I can. Now, every one of my classes has a class website. I use Google Sites, which is free and simple, but there are other free and simple options, too. And after every class, I post what we did on the website, and I upload any PowerPoint presentations, handouts, or other resources. This is very useful for students who are absent, because it saves turnaround time compared to having them email me. And it saves me time, because I can post everything while it's fresh in my mind. And I won't have to go searching for it when a student emails me. It's also useful for students who were in class, but who want to check something, or who lost the assignment, or who want to review the PowerPoint from that day. Making more information available to everyone is simply a good teaching practice, and a class website can help do that. Uh, just to check, is everyone looking at all of the bullet points, or is only one showing up? We've got them all. OK, good. Uh, let's see. So the responses um, that I've been getting from students are amazing. They love the class website, and many ask why other teachers don't use one. Uh, I've been thanked frequently for making it easy for students to stay caught up while they deal with the other challenges that life throws at them. Some people at this point ask whether making more information available makes students less responsible for themselves or less likely to show up to class. Firstly, uh, I believe it's not my place to judge how deserving a student is. I'm not a gatekeeper. I'm a guide. I think uh, I actually foster greater responsibility by getting students to check the class website and answer their own questions before coming to me. But even if I don't, I'm not here to teach responsibility, however I might define that. I'm here to teach my subject matter in the most effective way possible. Secondly, students at community and technical colleges are quite often older, employed, raising children, caring for other family members, dealing with medical issues, commuting long distances, or living on low or unstable income. They might face any of the challenges on this list, uh, and sometimes more than one. They don't need me to judge their absences away from class. They need me to teach them in a way that's compatible with their lives and the occasional emergencies that get thrown their way. A second element to providing students more information is my use of an online gradebook. I teach at two colleges. One college, uh, Mountain Hood Community College, has a a uh, gradebook that allows students to check their grades online. And it's broken down by assignment, which is very useful for them. I love this because it allows me to avoid these questions. Can you tell me what my grade is? Can you tell me what I'm missing? Why do I have a C? Do you remember what I got on my last essay? Um, it saves a lot of time at the beginning and ends of class when students would normally try to get my attention, but when I'm trying to either uh, set things up for the class or clear out so the next class can come into the room. But more than that, it's fair to students. Uh, it empowers them and it guards against teacher error. Every term, at least one student will catch an honest mistake on my part, and I'm glad I do. If I don't provide a way for them to keep track of their grade, they're at the mercy of any mistake I make. Uh, in fact, just today, as I was, I had graded people's tests and then I was inputting them online and I was trying to enter a 10, and the 1 just didn't take quite well, and I hit zero, 0 instead and skipped on down the line. And I looked back up a couple lines and saw it and said, hang on, that's not right. That student needed a 10, and I was able to go back and fix it. But what if I hadn't? Giving students the ability to check their own grades and compare them to the work that I hand back to them uh, allows them the ability to take control of their own learning and their own grades and guards against me making any kinds of those mistakes, because I'm sure I've made others those, uh, mistakes like that. My other college, oh, one more thing. Uh, my other college, uh, ITT Technical Institute, doesn't provide such an option, and I uh, used to hand out printed grade reports frequently. But now I've realized that I can email those grade reports just as easily by cutting and pasting them in, into an email. Uh, so it not only saves paper, but uh, it allows me to send those grades from uh, the comfort of my office or my home instead of hoping that all the students who need such grade reports are there on a particular day. The point is, your class exists outside of assigned hours. 
Now, a third structure that I've added in my classes is in accepting my essays only by email. Uh, this allows me to grade them electronically, which is far better than using a pen and paper. Consider this example. This can't be the most effective way to give written feedback, but it's what we're all used to. There is, actually, another way. Uh, Microsoft Word has the ability to uh, insert comments into the margins of a document. You can also give feedback at the end of assignment uh, in a different color text. Uh, Google Docs also has this feature, and if you want to keep all your assignments on uh, that you receive for a particular class on Google Drive, uh, then this will allow you to use this instead. Here are all the benefits that I've found, and unfortunately I don't have the animation that is coming up with this very last um, uh, box in the middle uh, after I get to it. Essentially though, the, the comments are neater, they're able to be edited, uh, you can write more and give more um, thorough feedback. Um, the, you have a, a, a record of who sent what when. Uh, you have duplicate copies with you and your students, so you don't have to hand, a, hand it back to them, the only copy you have of, your, of the comments that you spent so long writing. Uh, it saves space in trees and integrates new technology. And, most importantly, it disconnects due dates from the class sessions. At this point, I'm sure you're asking why anyone would want to disconnect due dates from class sessions. Well, consider this. This is how the first few weeks of my winter term would have looked if I'd only accepted and returned student assignments in class. So, I assign the, uh, I find, assign the first assignment here. Uh, it's returned here. I assign the first written assignment here. Um, or the, sorry. Here's the first class. Here's the first written assignment. Uh, first written assignment is due, and it's returned to students, and we discuss it, and I assign the first essay, but Monday is Martin Luther King Day, and so we don't have class on that day. So I can meet individually with students on Wednesday, and then they can turn in their first essay on the Monday of week four, and they finally get their first essay returned, and we can discuss it in class in Wednesday of week four. Look how that can change. Uh, if I'm no longer bound to being in class to receive assignments. Um, I can have that first essay returned to them by Wednesday of week three. I save myself an entire week because holidays are no longer time outside of class. Because students can turn something in on a day that they're not in class and I can have it back to them electronically. Anyway. So, I believe all three of these elements aid student success and retention, especially when used together. And I've never had a student complain about the amount of information that she had to access outside of class. But I have had countless students say that the class website and the online gradebooks have helped them take control of their own learning, recover from absences, and succeed in class. As for electronic grading, I never again want to carry around another stack of essays, nor fit my feedback sideways into a one-inch margin. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks so much, Zach. That was awesome. You and Liz were fabulous. Uh, Rosemary, you are up, and I'm just going to go ahead and find your slide here for you, and then you can get started. Let me get you here. Um, Did you notice so far we're all animal lovers? <laughs> yeah, I've seen lots of, lots of animal pictures in there. Okay, I'm turning it over to uh, Rose now. Go ahead and get started. Thank you, Alyssa. My name is Rosemary Regal, and I'm a doctor of education specializing in the socialization of online learners with digital technology. And many of you I would like to personally thank now for responding to my surveys so that I can publish in this area. But today, I just wanted to talk about why online courses are so great in the digital age. Okay, some of the tools that we have available, I'm going to very briefly demonstrate, come from both Canvas and outside of Canvas. Uh, WordPress, I use Go Animate. 
And I, I don't need to go down the whole list for you. I know these will be available. But I would like to take you on a tour, a brief tour of my classroom so that you can see a demonstration of some of these tools. Okay. Um, am I in the web tour? I apologize. This is what I can you cancel this out, Alyssa? Um, just click on the icon that has the world on it. That's the one you need, Rose. Thank That's you. That's the web tour. Yep, no Thank problem. You. It'll take Rosemary just a second to uh, sign in. Okay. In the meantime, while it's thinking, uh, I have collaborate, I have a link put in to all of my, my courses so that students and I can meet for a variety of reasons, whether it's to offer a presentation lecture, if someone's in distress, we can meet privately. And it's really a nifty tool, and it keeps everything linked directly to the classroom. Are we not going to go, Alyssa? Um, did you type the URL into the box? The little white box there underneath the world icon for uh, the, the okay. web tour you need to put in your, um, if you're trying to go to Canvas for your school. Ours is sbctc.instructure.com, so go ahead and type in um, whatever is there, and then click the button that says follow me. Okay. I thought I had to wait for the... Nope. It's waiting on you, actually. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. No so worries. So I clicked, I clicked follow me. Okay. It's all and a grand now... learning experiment. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Maybe Amber can help us out with some additional instruction. Amber, did we miss anything? Give me the link. I can go ahead and pull it up for you. Okay. It's HTTPS in, uh, Centralia dot instructure dot com. Oh, I bet you the. Well, my presentation will be brief. It's funny, it worked perfectly yesterday. There we go. Okay, well, here we go. Okay. I forgot I had to log into this too. Okay, so if you're logging in, you actually want to use AppShare. You do not want to use WebTour because everybody would individually need to. Well, you know, I was asking Jennifer about that yesterday and um, let me, uh, for this one time, because it'll be real quick, if you want to go ahead and put it back up, I'll go ahead and log in that way. Amber? Do you have your browser open, Rosemary? I, I want to go ahead and go into the website and not share okay. my desktop. Okay, so you, um, if you've got the browser open, click on the middle icon at the top. It looks like two little windows. And then just choose to share the browser that's open to your Canvas interface, and it should share to all of us. And then you can proceed to log in, and we'll see everything you see. Oh, okay. I need the, the instructor yeah. web address to back up. Um, okay, you, you have it open on your browser. So open your browser, whatever you use, Internet Explorer, Firefox. Um, I'm trying to think what another one okay, is. I'm gonna, um, make sure it's open on your computer. I'm going to go ahead and just share Amber. I'm going to go ahead and just share my desktop like I originally planned to do. And then that'll, you know, that'll stop the need for all that. Vanessa, I see that you have your hand up. Would you like to make a comment while we're waiting for um, Rose to get us logged in? 
If so, go ahead and click on your talk button. Can you see me? Uh, we can see your Centralia canvas now. Oh, okay, cool. We got so you. You're good to go. Okay, so I'm going to take you into my practice account that I set up up here. That will be that what I'm going to show you will be a part of all my spring courses. As a quality matters peer reviewer, I have my courses set up according to quality matters. So I like to include such things as a blog where students can post their discussion questions, hopefully in a fun manner. Either my system's too fast or Blackboard might be a little slow. Here we go. Okay, so one thing we do is I have them go on to Dr. Rose's blog. Now this was actually pulled in from Canvas. And within the blog, WordPress, I don't know how long ago they implemented, but in the early days, you couldn't put in photos or videos, but now you can. Okay, so I like to use the blogs. I also have, when I set up the WordPress, it automatically linked me into uh, web.com. I'm going to make things short here. So I set up a page where we can discuss community activity because having the ability to log in is one thing, but how do we really get students to log in? How do we maintain their interest? And of course the answer to that is user-friendly technology for assignments. So I have a web page that I ask them or will be asking them to go in for daily headlines. And I want them to talk about current events and how it's affecting their life. Okay. And that really gives some nice interaction. And if they don't have a daily event, then they can simply you know, express to each other what's happening in their life. Sometimes as instructors, we just want to say good job, right? So I use a tool called Animoto, and it just tells them good job. Sometimes, as we know, students may not always be on the mark for for one reason or another. So just very briefly, I'm going to play a little bit of this cartoon. And I use Go Animate. Hey, guys. Now that okay. Dr. Rose is out of the room, any ideas on why so many of us miss? Okay, so I like to use that. And students respond bond very well to these things. They feel like you care enough to reach out. Okay, I'll wait for the little circles to quit turning. And it's just a little bit of fun that cuts into what would otherwise be uh, maybe a little bit of boring going online and reading. So I use Vokey's avatars, and I can use I my voice. response to your discussion question this week, Mia, but one clarifier. Okay, or I can use 
a pre-programmed voice. University of Illinois say academic integrity means honesty and responsibility. Okay, so from my point of view as an online instructor, engagement with all of the digital technology available that is user friendly. Uh, Amber, can you load up my my other slide because I have a minute? Or Alyssa, I apologize. That was it. Okay, I like to also create video presentations that the is applicable to writing across the curriculum in as many courses as I can fit into these slides. And one of my favorites, if you were a student, you would be listening to Andy Williams sing Born Free. And in my English 101 course, I use it for a definition essay which is what is the definition of freedom. And in 102, I ask students to pose an argument, does freedom really exist? And what are the three rhetorical appeals that we can argue in, you know, what would be a much longer slide presentation? So. I say let's get them logged in and all the tools. I picked up some great ideas. Liz, I want to thank you and Zach, I want to thank you too because I think we all can put together good courses. All right. Thanks so much, Rosemary. You guys were all just fabulous and we're going to go ahead and um, go into our Q&A portion of the webinar now. And I'm just looking through the uh, chat here and it seems like there was a lot of chatter about FERPA when um, we were talking about um, sending student emails with student grade information. So um, would anyone like to speak more to that? If you do, go yeah. ahead and um, click talk. Looks like maybe Zach wants to say something. I was just going to say thank you for bringing that up. That's uh, definitely something to look into. OK, and, and I've always been instructed not to because we never really know who else might be in somebody else's email system? I think I saw mention of if the student has given permission. Um, I've never actually seen one of those forms, and I'm looking for who made the comment. Okay, Kathleen, you want to go ahead and address that for us? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you we hear can. me? Okay, great. Um, you know, I just was going through the VERPA site, which I've done a million times. It's it's not really spelled out electronically how you can, if you can do that. Um, so somebody suggested talking to your legal counsel at your school, which I think would be the best idea. And um, if you are using Canvas or an LMS, there's other ways that students can go in and get their grades. Um, so it's probably better to err on the safe side <laughs> and not email, but um, again, I think talking to your legal counsel would be the best thing because FERPA is kind of, doesn't really define it. And an email reminder to go check your grade with instructions and web links could, could also be acceptable. Yeah, especially if it's a site maybe where students have to have a secure login. Yeah, I think legally if it's a secure login, I, I think it's probably fine. I would I agree, but I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I just saw a question about using Canvas. I've actually started trying to use Canvas, one of the free accounts uh, for an individual teacher. Uh, we don't use it through our school. Uh, and I've started using it to find out if it could do everything that I was trying to do, but all in one system. 
Uh, unfortunately, I've found it frustrating to use, and students have found it frustrating too. There's, there are a couple students who never managed to actually sign on to Canvas and are trying to do the whole course without it. There are others who can't see the comments that I've written because there's this vast labyrinth of things that they have to click, as opposed to my original system of just opening an email downloading an attachment and seeing my comments in the margins, Canvas is proving confounding to them uh, to find my feedback and my notifications. So I haven't had much luck with it. Um, Zach, I can tell you that um, some of that is just figuring out, you know, using it because it's actually really pretty easy. And when you go into Crocodoc, when you do the comments, there's just a little eyeglass that you click on. but. I'd be happy to help you with that if you want because um, I think it's actually a pretty friendly system once you get, once you know it and then you can explain it to your students. And if I can add to that, once the course is set up according to quality matter standards and the modules become the primary access to their materials, it's much, much easier. I've received a lot of good feedback on that end of Canvas and really have not received a Canvas complaint in an extremely long time. But Zach, I hear you. Um, Zach, why don't we touch base after the webinar and um, I, we'd be happy to share out our state training course. It's geared toward instructors, but if you ran yourself through it, it may give you some insights into how Canvas works and allow you to help your students a little easier. And there's also online Canvas guides for students where they can go and look up how to do stuff. And I do completely agree with Kathleen's comment that once you get in there and get used to it, and get used to it, you, it it's really pretty easy. And my experience, um, having been an admin when the system was in the middle of migrating to Canvas, we actually had hardly any student problems. Um, most of the problems were having to have their password reset. But other than that, the students took to it actually much faster than our instructors had. So um, it's interesting that you're kind of having the opposite experience with that. I, I am. And there are students who upload files, and then I can't actually comment on them. And there are then students who uh, wires get crossed as far, well, I'm sorry, I don't need to be taking up this webinar's time. Anyway, thank you. That's okay. We can, we can, I'd be happy to have a chat with you about it. Um, Liz, I see you have a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say, Zach, um, that, you know, we, we all had no choice on moving to Canvas, so we kind of just had to do it. But, you know, it's sort of, um, it's been a mixed, you know, it's not perfect, but once you get used to it, you know, it is better. But I can see you you know, just using Canvas for your private gradebook, and then you can put links to your websites and all the stuff that you have already built. Just put a tab in the Canvas. We just go to Canvas, then go to, go to everything from there the way you want it, and then the gradebook issue would be solved, I think. So that's all. And I, I think Linda Foss brought up a good point because, you know, when students are left to their own devices, it's not really that they can't do it or that they won't do it. It's a matter of, do I want to do it? What is going to motivate students to really want to get online, figure things out, and then have a good quality learning experience? And I really enjoy the Canvas system and think that the system-wide usage may be the best way to go. All right, let's open it up for some other questions. Does anyone have specific questions for specific presenters or maybe a question that you'd like the panel to address as a group? If so, go ahead and chime in now. You can raise your hand or just go ahead and click your talk button and start Speaking. It looks like we have a quiet group today. So um, I'm putting some food for thought into the chat box. Maybe this will help stimulate some conversation for us. Perhaps not all courses can be taught online, but all courses can benefit from an online presence. 
and I'm going to throw that comment to our panel and get their input on that. Um, Zach's giving me a thumbs up. Liz, would you like to start the panel off on that and just give your input and say what you think of that? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. And um, I think uh, before we had Canvas and before we were even moving online, I had my ESL classes in a blog. Uh, and I had them each making their own blogs to practice their writing. And they just love it. And I think the visuals and the um, other components of online, and now there's more and more great um, sites they can go to to work on different specialized things for differentiated learning. It's wonderful. So the online classes is, is much bigger than the online class. And um, I think any kind of course, now that we're using Canvas, a lot of our teachers are starting to uh, bring in different elements of the online class into the ground classroom. So I think it's really exciting. And it's, um, you know, e-learning is not just the other learning anymore. It's part of everyone, everyone's experience now. Or it should be. <laughs> All right, Zach, you want to um, make a comment on that? I think this one's particularly um, relevant to you since you're um, working out of a face-to-face -face classroom and using web enhancements. Oh, I agree totally, absolutely. And so do I. I mean, not just because I teach online and hybrid, um, but I mean, globalization is here. We really cannot go back to where we were. So I vote that we embrace it in any form that's going to help our students succeed. That's actually a really great point, Rose. Um, you know, ever forward. It's, I mean, I don't think it's going to do us any good to go backward. I don't think we can go backward. I think it benefits us all to integrate some of these things into our classroom because students are already bringing technology to class. And they're already using it in their day-to-day -day lives. And we may as well bring that into our instruction. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate your point about um, making this a student success tool because even if 80% uh, of our students are fine without needing this, there, there are still a significant enough segment of each class that can benefit from greater contact and greater and a greater amount of information that really need it. Although since you mentioned the integration of technology into class, a friend of mine who lectures at University of Oregon just posted something on Facebook today. She has a lecture hall of 155 students, and she can't get them to talk, stop texting down below the seats where it's out of her. And she was just sending in a plea to other teachers if they could think of a way to tamp down on texting in a large lecture hall setting. Um, is she using it for instruction? Perhaps she could integrate an activity where the students are texting her instead of each other. I'll suggest that to her. Yeah, um, have her like partway through her presentation um, throw up um, into her slides or offer up um, like a question to the class and have it be a race for who can text her the correct answer first. So that can get the students more engaged in what she's doing and um, they'll start looking for that. I've also seen it done in presentations actually last year at InstructureCon. Um, I attended a presentation where, um, let's see, I think his name's Professor Josh. And um, he put, uh, he was using Twitter. Actually, he did it with all. He did Twitter, he did email, and he did texting all within the same session just to cover everyone. But every time you saw a certain symbol within his lecture that he was giving up on the screen on his slide, um, he was asking you to either tweet something or to text him an answer to something. It was really fun. It was really engaging to the audience. And don't forget that we have VoiceThread. VoiceThread can be embedded now where students have to respond back using VoiceThread. Yeah, I, um, I have actually used that. I used it as a student in a class I was in, and then I took and did a presentation with it. And that can be really fun. Um, there's actually a slide at the end of our my presentation slides that I can go to here in just a second.
that has um, some resources on it we can look at. Um, I'm going to throw another comment in here. We're just getting ready to wrap up, but I'm going to throw this one out to you as um, something to think on or to chew on. But there is a difference between using technology and integrating technology into your instruction. You don't want to use it just for the sake of using it. You want to have it integrated into your lesson where it is for student success and that it really um, increases the collaboration and the learning environment um, in your classroom. So um, just a comment that I wanted to throw out there for you. And um, since we are getting ready to wrap up here, let me get to, uh, let's see, those are our working definitions. Let me just go a couple slides deeper here. And um, here is a resource page, and there's the VoiceThread link that I just mentioned a minute ago. Here are some great e-learning e resources, Open Course Library, Educause, Khan Academy, uh, Poplet, if you haven't tried that one, that one's kind of fun. Uh, there's an interesting article down here at the bottom, 10 tips for better e-learning. So feel free to check out any of those extra resources and any of the resources that our fabulous presenters shared with us today. I actually learned a lot from them, some I hadn't heard of. And here's to how to contact the dynamic duo. duo. That would be Jennifer and myself. I'm new to tweeting, so um, I'm at Washington eLearning. So if you want to follow some Washington eLearning, um, I'm new to that. I'm learning how to use it. I'm taking baby steps. But you can follow me on Twitter if you want. You can follow Jen on Twitter, too. And here is our survey for this session. And if you would just do us a favor, and I will go ahead and throw this into the chat box for you as well, so you can grab the link. If you'll just go take our quick survey and share your thoughts, let us know how we did, what we can improve, uh, what topics you might want to see for next time. We would uh, love all of your feedback on that. And then um, coming up next, so um, our next webinar, which will be the fourth in our series, on March 20th, we're going to talk about Tweeting 101, using Twitter for professional development and classroom use. And we've got another great lineup of presenters from various colleges throughout our state. So please join us for that. And as promised, for anybody who may have missed our last two webinars, into the chat box, I'm putting um, the link for our first webinar and the survey that goes with that. And the next one I paste in will be the link and the survey for our second webinar. So if you enjoyed this survey and you might have missed the other two, please feel free to go back and watch those um, other recordings. I would, yep, they're all at 2 p.m. We're the first and third Thursday of the month. And we'll run on that schedule through um, the end of April. We're actually going to take the first week of April off, though, because lots of people are starting spring quarter, and it was just too hectic to um, get everybody organized and get presenters. I know you're all busy teaching and getting start classes started at that time. So we will not be meeting the first week of April. And then um, in May, after the ATL conference, we will start up, and we are going to be going weekly for about a month. And we will have all of our faculty learning communities checking in with us about what they learned this year. So uh, we hope that you'll join us. And we thank you for joining us today. A big round of applause to our awesome presenters and to Amber for helping me moderate. And um, if anybody has anything they'd like to add, please feel free to go ahead and do that. The link and access to the previous webinars. If you scroll up into the chat box, you will see where I added those into the comments. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. Thank you again to everyone, and we hope to see you next time.